questions about sort of the licensing framework and the changes between where we were and where we are. Uh, let's go one, two, and then three. Um, so I know we're going to get a lot more on the phone to be able to get a uh, license. Because I know with MRSA, with snow, and all of the Um So MRSA was actually yes on, on cannabis convictions. Cannabis convictions have never been grounds for exclusion oh. from the industry. Um, MRSA did have a higher threshold in that it identified specific crimes that were standards for denial. If you've done this, you're denied. Um, there are, I believe, three uh, charges that are still grounds for immediate denial under the New Combined Act. Uh, embezzlement, fraud, and one other one uh, that's related. Basically, uh, if you knowingly lied to people for monetary gain, um, then you can't get licensed. And then the threshold shifted slightly in that regard to the licensing agencies may consider prior convictions, but those prior convictions may not be the sole grounds for denial. And so um, cannabis charges with no enhancements should be pretty smooth sailing. Um, I think that you, know, you, you should expect enhanced scrutiny if there were firearms or violent enhancements. That's definitely something that the licensing agencies have told us that they'll be looking at. Um, with careful scrutiny, and the other thing that they've mentioned is uh, patterns. If they see a pattern of convictions, then they'll consider that as well. But if you picked up a cultivation felony somewhere along the way, I, I would I would breathe the sigh and, and let go of it. It should not be an impediment going forward. Um, other controlled substances may get a little bit more tricky. So far, the agencies haven't been explicit with us that they're going to be looking at you know, multiple drug charges, but I think there's a little bit more likelihood that they'll treat those with higher scrutiny. But if it was just a, a cannabis charge, I, I, would, I would breathe deep and look at other challenges. So. Are, can you guys all hear the questions? Should sure. I repeat the questions? Okay. Um, are they still incorporating the track and trace costs into the licensing fee? The latest is yes. Um, I don't think I'm hiding my skepticism that much. If I am, I'll be explicitly skeptical with you. Um, I am skeptical that the growers in particular won't bear more cost of that. Uh, we continue to, you know, I think I sent a letter to them about once a week. Uh, we do serve on the Department of Technologies. I don't know what they call their working group. There's way too many working groups and acronyms. But we, we hit that point every time. Um, our two points on track and trace are, one, we can't bear the cost of it. The state needs to. You need to give us a license fee that covers the costs of being regulated. And two, you have to make the system work for off-grid folks. Um, I think that they're hearing both of those messages pretty loud and clear. Um, I'm skeptical, which means I'm going to keep bugging them about it and be the squeakiest wheel I can be. Um, but at, at this point, the answer is yes, the cost will be all inclusive, including the fancy RFID tags that we have to put on every single plant. You never heard for So we've got a couple. Uh, actually, I think we just have one more. Yeah. On this uh, tricky question of premises, yes. Um, the this question of it just needing a separate entrance yep. and not a separate building. Yep. This is projected to be worked out, or is this in the current language of the, of the act? Um, the current language of the act is actually not specific on it. If you go to the current regs is where you get the definition about distinct uh, separate entrance. Uh, that is the best word we have is in those regs. And actually, this is a great time to talk briefly about the regulatory process. So everybody reviewed the regulations that came out a couple months ago, right? Each agency did their own regs. Those regs are about to get revoked in their entirety because the law upon which those regs were based is no longer a law. It was repealed in its entirety. They will make new regs based on this. Hint, not a lot has changed with regard to the regs. The regs will probably look very similar. In this case, we are assuming, but I think it's you know a 95% confidence threshold that we use to assume that it will be the same definition. So uh, we're, we're, we're relatively certain that it will be the same or slightly looser. Of the? Of the regulations. Of the, no, of the regulations. The legislation doesn't get into the nuts and bolts quite as much as the regulations do. So you mean business and professional? No, the regulations, I think it's Title 13. It's, oh. it's not in state law, it's in uh, the uh, state regs. 
Let me see. Yeah. So where, where go to what's up? Where do we find those? Uh, you go to cannabis.ca.gov. Uh, each one of the licensing agencies will have a link. Each one of the agencies will have a link to their uh, proposed regulations on those sites. And so those those ranks technically no longer have statutory authority, but they'll be very, very, very similar to the emergency ranks that we'll see a little bit later on in the year. Uh, please, I'll try to know what's right there. No. No. So the cultivation license, uh, the question was if you have two separate guardians with separate entrances, do you need separate licenses? The answer is no. Um, they can be non contiguous areas. And so, you know, if you've got one 2,000 square foot orchard and one 2,000 square foot orchard, that still qualifies as a single type one. Um, you will have to show them a site plan for both, and they'll want to see how you get to and from and, you know, infrastructure in between the two. So, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to have 2,000 square feet in Lake County and 2,000 square feet in Minnesota. You'd have to have them close by as part of, like, the same site. But as long as you meet those thresholds, then you can do it all in one place. Uh, let's go to the back here. I think you answered my question. So three gardens on a large parcel, three separate gardens that are fenced in with their own gate, that you can walk from one to the other, you still just need the one permit for it because you'll lay out the plans yes. to show them why. Yep, and, and if you wanted to split them up and have multiple licenses, you, there are multiple licenses and businesses you could try for that, but if you're going to put it all under the umbrella of one, that should be pretty straight. Okay, thank you. Yes. So um, to follow up, and so shifting away from cultivation, if you have a retail outlet and manufacturing, you could be in the same building if you have separate entrances. And, and, and in that case, no crossover between the two of them. Uh, and so you'd have to walk out of the separate entrance and into the separate entrance. It doesn't have to be an entrance to the outside, necessarily. It just has to be an entrance to the space, which has to be exclusively under control of the licensee. So maybe you have a different investor on the retail side, whatever. I mean, you, you yeah. Like I said, we, one sec, like I said, we are advocating that reception areas, break rooms, those sorts of things, as currently written, you could have your manufacturing and your retail in the same building, but you would have to have a separate break room, separate bathroom, separate reception area for each one. We do, I'm not going to give it 95% confidence threshold on that, but I'll say 85% confidence threshold that we'll see some easing on those commonly shared facilities. We've got support letters from the League of Cities, uh, CSAC, the counties, the rural counties, the police chiefs. We've, we've done a pretty good job of drumming up support, so I do expect that it's practical for them to pass this year. Um, I think we have one more over here, then we'll jump to this side. Um, does the medical, medicinal, and the recreational cultivation have to be separated in designated areas or could you have one 10,000 square foot area that does both you know it doesn't matter which plants yep uh, so do does cultivation have to be separate square footages separate plants or can you have the same square footage same plants growing into either market um, currently separate currently you will have to have a type 1 adult a type 1 medical medicinal they will have to be separate areas um, with separate premises and we again this is another one of the pieces that when we negotiated the bill we were of the understanding that that wasn't the case the bill actually says that it is we've talked to the governor's administration they agreed that that was not the intent and you know sometimes bills are they're big and messy to make so um we spilled some or whatever however you want to imagine it we made a little boo-boo um and and we think that that will get cleaned up in time and so the intent is that you can have if you have 5,000 square feet, that can be double licensed as a type 1A, type 1N. Same plant, same products, you decide where it goes after it moves down the supply chain. Same with the manufacturing facility. It could have be a type A and a type M extraction facility. You bring product in from either and you send product out to either. Um, I'll, I'll go as high as 95% confidence that that'll be addressed this year. We have a very, very high degree of certainty. Two questions. Actually, on that, would you have to tag it as A or M, or can you make that determination later? And then a follow-up question about regs. Uh, so, on the first one, with the plant tags, would you have to tag the plant as either? Um, our understanding is that you would be able to tag the plant as both. 
if you were dual licensed, you could get one RF RFID chip, stick it on the bottom there, and it could be coded as both an A and an M. When you transact, though, you will have to designate there. And so the manufacturer or the, whoever the product's going to will need to code, the, the, the tracking code will have to pick one or the other at that point. Um, the second question about regulations, last time when the regulations were disseminated and there was a comment period, some of us spent a considerable amount of effort writing lengthy comments. How uh, important is it for people, and will do, in your experience in these working groups, will they really consider, or are the negotiations kind of set in terms of the impact of everybody dropping everything, responding to the emergency regs in the comment period? Yep. Uh, question was basically, what's the importance of public comment? Does it really matter? Are all the negotiations taking place, and are, is everything already answered? Um, I think particularly with an ear to the fact that we just had a whole reg set that we all spent a bunch of time commenting on that now is legally out the window. And so I'll try to touch on sort of all of the facets of the question. Um, first and foremost, the time and the work that you put in was not time wasted. They are absolutely 100% considering those comments and that is their starting point. Um, and so in order to answer the next part of the question, um, We'll have to get in briefly to the difference between regular rulemaking and emergency rulemaking. So normally when the state of California issues regulations, you the agency will issue them and then there will be the 45-day comment period. We just went through this, so everyone should remember. You have 45 days to comment, they take the comments in, they consider it, they make any changes, and maybe they have to go back for another 45-day comment period. That is the regular rulemaking process. However, when a state of emergency is declared, there is the emergency rulemaking process. In that one, the agencies will write the rules down, they'll give them to the Office of Administrative Law, that's the office within the state government that sends you all the notice that says, hey, these regs are available for review and comment, except for, instead of saying, hey, these regs are available for review and comment, they say, hey, here's your regs. And then they go into effect. There's a seven day comment period in which you are allowed as a stakeholder, you are allowed to submit whatever comments you want, but they will only consider comments related to the constitutionality of the regulations. They will not consider the content, they will not consider what's in the rules, that will all just get put into a separate stack and forwarded on to the agency, and all that the Office of Administrative Law will consider is the constitutionality of the proposed regulations. For example, if they said, hey, there's a state of emergency, you don't have freedom of speech anymore. That wouldn't be a legitimate regulation. They couldn't just cram that through because there was a state of emergency. Um, but a lot of other things that are not directly constitutional, they'll be able to do. So, they will be using their emergency rulemaking authority. I think it's kind of funny, actually, a tangent here. How many people have seen a headline lately about Nevada declares a state of emergency? Not enough weed. <laughs> we declared a state of emergency for cannabis 18 months ago. California technically declared a state of emergency because of the unregulated cannabis marketplace with the passage of SB 837 uh, early on in 2016. So we've been operating in that de facto state of emergency for some time now. They will be using their emergency authority for the next set of rules. You will get rules probably around September 15th and you will get to review them, but it won't matter. In the immediate sense, they will go into effect before you have a chance to comment on them. The saving grace here is that emergency rules can only be enacted for 180 days. 180 days from the time they are enacted, they will automatically sunset unless they're renewed. In this case, they can be renewed once. So the regulatory agencies have basically one year before they have to go through the full regulatory process with the full public comment period. My understanding is that they're going to get these rules out in September, their six-month period will end about in March, and their goal is to go through a full rulemaking uh, period between March and September of next year. And so they will likely issue emergency regs that will be in effect until March. They will extend those emergency regs one more time until September, but between March and September, we will have the full permanent rules to review and comment on. That is what I've been told from the licensing agencies is their rough timeline for going forward. Yes, please. So, I'm in the understanding that uh, right now, in 2018, a farmer can't bring his product to a dispenser. 
And um, if that is the case, and we have to go through a distributor, is it automatically in 2018, all product that goes through dispensary has to go through a distributor on January 1st? Or how long is it until that goes into effect? So I, he's got a big voice too. I think you guys all heard that one, right? All right. Um, so that is actually one of the kind of gray areas. Um, we have asked them for greater clarification on what the in-between period will look like. Let's look at the back. Their crisis is created not by lack of product, but by lack of distribution. And so they're aware that there will not be a lot of distributors up and running on day one. Um, your ability to operate under the collective model with the collective defense won't sunset for one year after full implementation. And so I think there might be a little bit of gray area that persists, unfortunately. It won't be cut and dry. Um, my advice though, what I, you know, I would advise, find a distributor as quickly as possible and have that supply chain worked out. There will be a market advantage to having a regulated supply chain early. If you're in the September of 2018 and still don't have a distributor and you're up against that deadline, that's a tough spot to be. Um, and so, actually, if you guys are up for it, this is a great time to segue into talking about distribution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. question first? All right, we'll hit pause, we'll, we'll take two questions and then we'll jump into distribution. Okay. I have definition currently of micro-business. In micro-business, uh, what is the definition of micro-business? Uh, a micro-business, is a single license that allows for cultivation of up to 10,000 square feet, the manufacturing, distribution, and sale of those products by one entity with one license. Um, great idea. It sounds amazing, right? It sounds really fantastic. Unfortunately, the way that the, the framework is set up, that doesn't mean you get to get one cultivation premise and then do all of those things from the farm automatically. You still need permitted facilities. You still need to meet all of the labor laws for all of the activities. And under the MAUCRSA, you will also need to demonstrate that you are meeting the requirements for each of the activities you are doing. So if you're going to do all four of those activities, you actually have to have a relationship with each licensing agency. You don't need a license and you don't pay them a fee, but you do have to be able to demonstrate that you're meeting their requirements. So it's a bit more of an administrative headache than I think, um, when I think micro-business, I think you know the concept that we're trying to advance with cottage grow. Streamline, easy, grow 25 plants, keep on paying your bills like you've been doing for goodness, you know, for generations in our cases. Um, I think the micro-business is probably going to end up being a bit more sophisticated of a license. It won't be the simple streamlined option. It'll be a bit more sophisticated option. I think there will be a lot of benefit there, but I can say that my hesitation is shared by the licensing agencies. They're not quite sure how they're going to figure out a consultation process. How are you going to demonstrate compliance without going through the licensing process? That's quite literally what the licensing process is. So we will see how it all pans out. Um, it's, it's, it's a great concept. I think we're certainly trying to see it move forward, but there are some implementation challenges. Yeah. Yep, yep, there it is. Okay. And so just I wanted to go back over what I think I'm hearing in the timeline is that we don't expect a state application to be available until after March. No, state application should be right around September 15th. As soon as the regs are done, yes, you should expect to see an application right around when the regs are done. Their goal is to get applications out prior to the January 1st deadline. Um, their deadline is technically to accept applications on Jan 1. There's no way they could accept them if they weren't already available. And so I would, I would realistically, I think they're being a little bit optimistic with their September 15th deadline, but I would expect license applications realistically should be available by um, October 15th. I'll, I'll, I, I actually got to sit down and play with the licensing software the other day in our Department of Technology working group. I created a login, I logged in, I, it's already there, it's real. They have the, the technology. Um, I've applied for a lot of state contracts and grants and whatnot, and this is hands down one of the most streamlined systems I've ever seen. So I'm going to give them a gold star so far for licensing. It should be ready for you to set your accounts up, start logging in, start uploading things, etc. I would say, again, maybe in October. Okay, so does it still that SB 420 will be in effect for a year from that date? A year from full implementation. And so 
full implementation is not when they make applications available, it's when they've got everything up and running. My expectation is that Lori Ajax, the chief of the bureau, will certify full implementation mid-year 2018. I think that the SB 420 will probably persist until mid-year 2019. I would, again though, to the gentleman that I mentioned back here, I would be ready to cut those ties sooner than later. The longer you're up against that deadline, the harder it's going to get. So as quickly as you can transition away from that model, I advise it. Technically, I think you have some reason.